Um, okay, Tom, so we are ready. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, please. Okay, Hello. thanks very much. Thank you very much uh, indeed. It's a, a real pleasure to, um, to be with you. Let me just uh, see if I can find my talk. Oh, whoops, no, not that one. That one. Um, okay, I hope everyone can see the, um, the screen. If not, well, you better tell me to stop quickly. Uh, thank you very much, Francisca. It's a real pleasure to um, be here to talk to you today. And um, although we've had a lot of negativity and terrible experiences this year, if one looks for some positives, it is that we can meet on forums like this and, uh, and talk to each other in different continents. Isn't, isn't that a wonderful thing? And I hope that this continues. Uh, in the future. Anyway, my talk today, as you uh, just heard, is about the um, middle to late Paleolithic, to middle to upper Paleolithic, and the very interesting um, situation that we have with respect to different types of humans, um, different species of humans that existed over the course of the last um, 40 to, oh God, how do I do this? I can't seem to go on to the next. Okay. Um, to uh, the story of the um, of humanity between 100,000 and 40,000 is the subject of my talk today. And as you probably already know, but I'll give you a brief um, rundown, the prevailing uh, theory for the origins of humanity is that uh, we ultimately evolved in uh, Africa. And um, at some point, some people suggest that it's 50 to 60,000 years ago, other people suggest that it's perhaps 120,000 years ago, um, but there is evidence for even earlier uh, excursions or exits of um, anatomically modern humans from Africa. Uh, we moved out of Africa, a subset of uh, African uh, people, and they moved into um, the old world, um, eventually um, dispersing into points west and east, um, and eventually um, ending up, as we know, throughout the, uh, throughout the known world. So the um, precise nature of exactly what happened has been um, a very controversial one over the last um, century or two. Um, for example, before 2010, we, we, we didn't really know whether or not modern humans um, had ever physically encountered some of the uh, hominins that had, they had been evolutionary, evolutionarily separated from for many hundreds of thousands of years. Um, the most um, well known, of course, being the Neanderthals. Um, the Neanderthals, I'm gonna talk, talk individually about Neanderthals, Denisovans, and modern humans. And first, I'd like to, um, to describe some of the work that we've undertaken um, over the last uh, 10 to 15 years regarding uh, Neanderthals. As you probably know, Neanderthals were mainly distributed in the west of Eurasia, um, concentrated in Europe, but also extending into the Levant, the Zagros Mountains of Iran and Iraq. And in uh, 2007, amazingly, um, a large bone that was discovered at the site of Okladnikov Cave in the Russian Altai, um, which was at that point not known with certainty as to the biological attribution. We didn't know what it was. It was just a large um, series of large bones from this important site were analyzed using ancient genetics, ancient DNA methods by the group of Svante Pabo in Leipzig. And they discovered that the bone was actually mitochondrial, at least um, a Neanderthal. And so this spread the distribution of Neanderthals beyond Europe um, and beyond Central Asia towards um, the uh, Altai, which is uh, the dot on the map there, about 1500 kilometers further to the east than we had known about before um, the distribution of Neanderthals. And we now know, of course, since 2010, that Neanderthals um, and modern humans interbred. Um, this came as a huge surprise because the record from mitochondrial DNA didn't show any interbreeding whatsoever. It was only when the Neanderthal Genome Project, again led by the Pabo group in Leipzig, uh, published its findings in 2010, that we knew that Neanderthals and modern humans had interbred. And we now know that that um, archaic DNA is still with us today. And it's a, a proportionally about 1.1 to 2.6%. Across Asia, it's very similar in terms of its level. This map is slightly old um, because it shows that 
people in Eastern Asia seemed to have more Neanderthal DNA than people in the West of Eurasia. But we now know that this is a function of the fact that uh, we assumed prior to this that African people didn't have any Neanderthal DNA. And now we know that a small proportion of Neanderthal DNA is visible in African genomes. And once we take this into account, the record of um, the amount of DNA in Asia, um, East and West, is almost exactly the same. And you'll note that um, the, um, the presence of DNA spreads uh, across um, modern humans and these living populations um, across most of the world outside of, um, of, 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 Af of Africa. So a lot of the work that I do, because I work in um, radiocarbon dating, a lot of the work that I've been um, interested in is looking at the record of disappearance of Neanderthals. When did Neanderthals become extinct? Because of course there are no Neanderthals uh, today, although we have DNA from Neanderthals, we know that there are no Neanderthals um, still extant. And so um, the main method that we have for understanding Neanderthal disappearance and uh, extinction is radiocarbon dating. And one of the big problems with radiocarbon um, is that when we're dating very old things, it's very difficult because small amounts of contamination, contaminating carbon, can produce dates that are too young. And so what, um, uh, what I was involved in in the early 2000s was working to develop better methods to provide more reliable and accurate radiocarbon dates mm -hmm. from principally bones and bone collagen. So we um, applied um, and um, developed further um, a method of using ultrafiltration for dating um, samples of um, bone collagen. And then more recently, we've been working on new methods to uh, extract single amino acids, which uh, removes all of the contaminants. So over the course of about 10 years, we worked on um, around 70 uh, archaeological sites and we obtained more than 500 new radiocarbon dates from mostly these classic sites of the Neanderthal um, modern human um, interface uh, across um, Spain and France and Germany and Italy and Greece and the British Isles. Um, and we were very interested in looking at when, um, as I say, when, when the last Neanderthals were present. And so one of the things we were interested in doing was to focus on sites which had the Mousterian uh, industry, which is strongly linked with Neanderthals in Europe, and then um, comparing those um, radiocarbon dates with uh, dates from other stone tool industries that are linked to modern humans, such as the Aurignacian. And also looking at some of the um, radiocarbon dates from stone tool industries that are probably Neanderthal or might be modern human, and we, these we call the transitional industries, and they fall between those two periods. So these are the sites that contained evidence for late Neanderthal occupation. And there were 40 sites altogether that we looked at and we obtained uh, from these sites 200 radiocarbon dates. And in this particular um, example, I'm going to give you um, the results, the summary of the results um, from all of those 200 dates. And these are in the form of probability distributions that give us the last date for sites in Spain um, Western and Northern Europe, and in South and Eastern Europe. And what you can immediately see is that these um, date estimates for the last Neanderthals all fall before 40,000 years ago. So you can see the line of 40,000 years, all of them are before 40,000 years. And so we were able to calculate that the disappearance of Neanderthals occurred between 39 to 41,000 years ago at 95% probability. So that's a very high level of confidence um, we think that this is a minimum age and that's almost certain that Neanderthals disappeared at this time, perhaps a little earlier, but subsequently this paper that we published in 2014, um, we haven't um, seen anything to change the um, conclusion that Neanderthals uh, disappear from the world almost exactly 40,000 years ago. But we also found there was variation in the age of these final Mysterian sites. And when we looked at the dates from modern human sites, we calculated that there were between two and a half and five and a half thousand years of time during which Neanderthals and modern humans were both living in Europe. And that was a big surprise to us because I thought that it was more likely 
that Neanderthals disappeared upon the arrival of modern humans. But that doesn't look to be the case. In fact, there's evidence now that modern humans and Neanderthals may have overlapped for much longer than this as well. I think it may be even more than 7,000 years. And that's interesting because we don't have evidence for them living in the same sites. We have evidence perhaps for them living in different locations. And they surely must have had influence uh, upon each other. We know that they interbred with each other in Europe as well. So the situations become very, very interesting indeed, and a lot more complex than it was. This complexity extends to recent discoveries um, in 2010, which really, um, I think, um, blew away a lot of us. Um, we weren't expecting this. So in um, 2008, a very small piece of human bone, this is uh, the size of it, from, uh, uh, from a, the right hand of a girl, probably uh, aged in her early teens, was excavated in, um, in Denisova Cave, which is a very important cave in the Altai region of Siberia, which I'll show you in a second, um, some pictures and a map. Um, the Svante Pabo team um, extracted DNA from this and the initial um, uh, analysis of mitochondrial DNA showed that the DNA from this small finger bone uh, was not from modern humans, nor was it from Neanderthals. It was from something else, uh, a different group. And in the absence of a lot of skeletal remains that would enable us to describe and classify it and to give it a holotype, um, these, this species has remained known as simply the Denisovans. This um, bone is called Denisova III, and um, you can see uh, here on the right, it was originally a, a much bigger bone um, that was divided into two parts. One, of it, one part was uh, sent to a, another genetics lab laboratory in California, and the small part was sent to the Parbo lab. And um, most of you will, um, I'm sure, know that um, like the Neanderthals, these Denisovans, originally found at Denisova Cave, also contribute to modern human DNA. In fact, we know that some present day humans uh, derive um, around 5% of their ancestry from Denisovans, and these people are concentrated in um, Melanesia, um, um, the island of New Guinea, and amongst Aboriginal Australians, whom also have um, about the same amount of Neanderthal DNA as um, other people in uh, Eurasia. And um, latterly, uh, we, we have also become aware that there are this uh, small amount of DNA uh, from Denisovans in people in South Asia, East Asia, and also in Japan. Recent work has shown that the Denisovans don't consist either of one population, but they consist of at least two, perhaps three, because um, people in um, East Asia, in Japan, China, and in island, in island Southeast Asia and Papua New Guinea um, have two different sources of uh, Denisovan DNA indicating two separate populations. So things have become very much more complicated, as I say. In some cases, we now know that Denisovan DNA contributes to um, important aspects of human biology. So if you're a Tibetan, you benefit from a gene, um, a part, small uh, part of a gene called EPAS1, which is linked very strongly to the ability to live at altitude and resist um, hypoxia. And this uh, DNA um, came directly from Denisovans and then was adaptively uh, selected for, it was advantageous. And so it has a very high frequency amongst modern Tibetans. And it's what allows them to survive and prosper at very high altitude where the oxygen is very low. So Denisova Cave is, um, for those of you that aren't aware, it's in um, the Russian Federation and it's um, about halfway across uh, Eurasia at the area where Russia meets Kazakhstan, Mongolia, China. And it's a um, high alpine area. Well, it's an alpine area um, with some quite high mountains in it, but the area that we're interested in, in the Russian side, is, um, looks like this. It's got nice um, alpine rolling hills. Um, this is looking down at the um, valley of the Anui River, which is down here. And as we um, look from the other direction, you can see that at the base of uh, this hill, there's a, um, some buildings. And this is the base camp of the Denisova team. The cave itself was, um, is located right here. And uh, it was first excavated in 1977 by Nikolai Ovodov, who was a Russian 
a paleontologist. It's one of the few um, good caves in the area. And uh, what was interesting to Ovidov, here's the entrance to the cave down here, um, was that it had a very deep stratigraphy of around three, just over three meters. And it contained a long record of prehistory back to around 300,000 years ago. This is um, the entrance to the cave up that small, um, uh, small track. And once we're inside the cave, there are three main chambers. So this is the entrance here. There's the main or central chamber, which was the first area to be excavated. And there are two other smaller chambers, the east chamber and the south chamber. And they've all been excavated since 1977, but mainly in the 80s, um, 90s, and in the years since around 2008. This is a picture showing the main chamber um, at one of the um, meetings that I attended in 2014. And so the main excavation is just here behind this fence where these people uh, are standing. Um, and the layers that you can see here that look very nicely stratified are all Holocene in age. And below that, we go into the, um, the Paleolithic uh, layers. Um, I should say that uh, through that, um, through that um, small um, uh, cave uh, there, that is into the east gallery, uh, east chamber, which is where most of the really important um, human remains have been found. So this is looking down into the east chamber. It's been excavated um, quite extensively. Um, in this part of the cave, they're down now to the bedrock. But if you look carefully, you can see in the distance some of the archaeological layers uh, at the site that have been excavated. Um, a ladder going down. This is where that very important um, Denisova III specimen was excavated. Um, another view of excavations proceeding in the east chamber. When we look at the stratigraphy, um, you can see that in the main chamber, we have early middle Paleolithic from layers 22.3 up to uh, 21. And then the middle Paleolithic layers 20 to 12. And then the early upper Paleolithic um, from around 11.4, 11.5 um, up until 9.1. And then above that is the Holocene levels. Now in the east chamber, unfortunately, the two um, chambers are not linked stratigraphically. So we don't know exactly how they relate to one another. For this, we need to rely on, um, on chronometric dating methods to establish the link between these two areas of the cave. Um, this is some pictures of the, um, of the stone tools uh, that would have been found at the site. Um, for the most part, from about 300,000 years ago to around 50,000 years ago, um, we have um, middle Paleolithic um, stone tools that are then succeeded by um, an, an initial upper Paleolithic. And this um, includes um, amongst it some important um, aspects of personal ornamentation and jewelry and um, items of uh, pierced animal teeth. And a very interesting and controversial uh, discovery is this um, polished um, uh, jade brace, part of a, what is thought to be a bracelet. It, um, many people consider it to be intrusive into those layers, but um, the Russian archaeologists are quite convinced that there is no um, way for that. And I think when you look at the stratification of the Hol Holocene layers, um, one tends to think that it, it's difficult to see how it could be um, coming from much higher up. Uh, the, um, the personal ornaments um, include things like ostrich eggshell, beads, um, bone tools, um, beautiful needles like this one on the right, lower right hand side here, and um, uh, items of um, bone rings, ivory, um, and so on. The human remains um, of the Denisovans are very, very fragmentary and few. They consist of that um, small bone that I mentioned, which is the Denisova three uh, finger. Um, they have um, two, uh, the other, other items are teeth. Um, this quite large um, tooth here is um, the, the tooth, um, this is Denisova four. It's uh, probably an a, 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 a M3, a molar, it could be an M2, a small deciduous tooth a couple of other uh, small deciduous teeth, and that's basically it. The controversy initially was the age of the Denisovans. Um, the bone, uh, the Denisova III high coverage genome um, was um, radiocarbon dating evidence uh, supported it to be perhaps as old or older than 50,000 years ago, 
but it could be also as young as 30,000 years ago. And so um, the initial paper that was published in 2010 wasn't able to put a firm age on, the, um, on, on, that, on that human remain. And neither of the other remains have um, been dated successfully either. Um, and that's not surprising because they're very, very small and um, the material that is around them is very fragmentary. And there has been the suggestion that um, there has been some uh, potential movement and, um, and reworking in some areas of the site. Although, as we'll see, our work uh, suggests that's not the case. Now, in an attempt to find more human remains, um, since this is a bioarchaeology as well as a chronology um, seminar series, I thought it would be interesting to mention some of the work that we've been involved with. Um, the preservation of um, bone at the site is very good, and the, the level of DNA preservation is very high. So Denise of the three, for example, had 70% endogenous DNA, which is um, very, very high and almost unheard of in the world of um, genetics, ancient genetics. Um, and this is because the cave is cold, and so the preservation of biominerals is favoured. Now, because the human material is very small, and because most of the um, animal bone and other bones from the site are very, very fragmented, because they have been um, influenced by predators, such as hyenas, who've been eating and chomping through these bones, and by humans, we um, wondered whether or not in the unidentifiable bones from the site, which comprise 95% of all of the bones from the site, whether there might be some small remains that could be human in these um, um, packages of bone. About 125, 130,000 sm um, small bones like this from the site when we began our work, 95% of which were unidentifiable. And so we decided to use um, um, a quite novel technique, which is now being used quite um, a lot in archaeology, um, called Zooms, Zooarchaeology zoo by Mass Spectrometry, which is a technique that um, it's, it is able to be used to identify the peptide sequences in bones such as this. And it so happens that these sequences of mass peptides, they vary between different species and sometimes within different genuses. So we use this technique to search for human bones in the um, archaeological um, fragments of bone that uh, have been excavated at the site. Um, my then master student, Samantha Brown, uh, took on this project and she um, succeeded in finding um, some um, human bone from the site using zooms, um, which I'll describe in a second. So to cut a long story short, these tiny bone fragments are sampled individual bones are then um, given an, a, a unique number and the small bone fragments are then put into these treff tubes where they are then um, analyzed uh, using mass spectrometry to cut a long story short. Um, we have analyzed several thousand bones and we've succeeded in finding human remains. Um, the most important one found thus far was the first one and that's this one here which we call Denise 11. But subsequently, subsequently, we found more um, human bone materials, which are identified firstly by zooms and secondly by ancient DNA. The, um, the, the bones that you're seeing here are very, very small. Um, the first bone that was found is 2.4 centimeters long. And so you get an idea of the size of these. They're tiny, tiny bones, and you would never be able to identify them without um, bioarchaeology and genetics techniques. They just look like any bone fragment. And some of them have a lot of DNA in them. Some of them have no DNA and some of them have a little bit of DNA in them. The first one here, the Denise 11 uh, bone was um, very interesting because it, dis it showed that the bone was the um, first generation offspring of two different uh, human species, um, Neanderthal and Denisovan. The Neanderthal was the mother of this person and the Denisovan was the father. And so this was published in 2018. And it just shows how, how um, important DNA is, not only for telling us about um, um, the uh, identification of different people in the archaeological record, but also about the record of um, interbreeding between different human groups. And one thing we, we thought about a lot when this was discovered was, well, how common could this be, this 
uh, interbreeding. And um, we concluded that it was likely that whenever these different groups came together, they probably um, interbred with one another, but that they couldn't have done this on a regular basis because if they did, the DNA from, from Neanderthals and Genesivans would be the same or much, much closer than it, uh, than it seems to be. And so um, we, um, we, we concluded that this was um, a piece of luck really, but we need to do more work to figure out if that is indeed the case. Now, um, the importance of zooms to Denise of a cave is shown by the fact that we have now um, increased substantially the number of human remains that we find in the site. So um, we have more than doubled now. This uh, slide is, um, needs to be updated. In fact, we have now doubled the um, number of uh, human remains from the site. And this is in no small part due to uh, the work of um, Katarina Duca, who has a, um, a large project called Finder working on this and Samantha Brown, who's just finished her PhD now in the Max Planck Indiana, uh, looking at, um, at this, um, extending this work. And she and Katarina's team have identified more human remains from the site. And this summarizes that um, as of um, earlier this year. So what you can see here is the stratigraphic sequence of the main chamber, the east chamber, and the south chamber at Denisova Cave. And where you see these little round circles with the numbers in, those, re those describe the locations of Neanderthals in blue and Denisovans in red uh, down through the section here at the site. Um, we have also been um, amazed by um, new work um, by, the, um, by the Pabo group and um, work by um, Viviana Slon and Matthias Meyer of extracting DNA from sediments. And so also on this um, illustration, you can see Denisovan sediment DNA um, found here in layer 15, Neanderthal sediment DNA found here in layer 14, and over in the east in the main chamber, Neanderthal DNA um, from these archaeological layers um, from 19.1 to 14.3 in the middle Paleolithic. So what we can see here is intriguing because it shows that there has been a sequential replacement of different hominin occupations through this site from Denisovans to Neanderthals to interbreeding between Neanderthals and Denisovans, Denisovans, Neanderthals, and um, up here in layer um, 9.2, uh, when we found uh, this bone using zooms, we thought that the date of this at around 46,000 years ago might be indicative evidence for the arrival of modern humans in Denisova cave. But unfortunately, we couldn't get any DNA out of it. And so we weren't able to um, identify the presence of modern humans at this point, at least in the archeological levels at Denisova, that's still remains to be discovered. But the work is um, progressing. And as I say, even more human remains have been found and even more human DNA has been found. Um, there's a, there are dozens now of samples at Denisova cave, which have produced human DNA. So it's a really exciting site, a unique site in the world because of the fact that so many different types of humans have been found in this area. So the, um, the people that are responsible for the genetics work, of course, um, Svante Pabo and his team and Viviana Slon, who finished her PhD last year, um, worked on um, all of these um, specimens, um, most importantly, Denisa 11. And you can see here, um, this is um, a plot showing the distribution of the, um, the, 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 the mitochondrial DNA from the site, Denisovans down here, this part of the tree, and then Neanderthals um, up here, and the Denisovan um, Neanderthals are these ones given in, in red. The Akladnikov Neanderthal that I mentioned earlier is this one right here. So we have been trying to, as I say, radiocarbon date um, the archaeological sequence, and colleagues have been working on the um, luminescence or optical dating of the sequence as well. Radiocarbon is useful at the site, but only up to a point because most of the archaeology is beyond radiocarbon. And so one of the big problems that we had when we tried to date the site was how to get around the problem of most of this material being uh, too old for radiocarbon. And so what we did was we developed a method of dating the site using multiple sources of information. Radiocarbon for the top parts of the site, optical dates for the lower parts of the site, and we use the mitochondrial mutation rate estimates 
to work out the relative age of human remains in the site. So as you know, um, as, um, as time goes by, mutations build up in mitochondrial genomes and nuclear genomes for that matter too. And so it's possible to compare the mitochondrial genomes from these uh, bones and work out the number of mutations that have accrued and then to calculate the age difference on that basis. So for example, in this particular case, you can see the difference between that very large tooth Denisova 4 and uh, Denisova 3, the little pinky bone, has been worked out in terms of mitochondrial mutation to be about the same age. They have about the same number of mutations. So between 3.7 and 6.9 thousand years difference between these two um, uh, human remains in two different parts of the site. And we have other information too from other bones that allows us to look at the differences in age estimated on the basis of their mutation rates. So for example, um, in the case of um, Denisova, uh, uh, Denisova 5 and Denisova 11, we know that there's between 7.5 and 13.7 thousand years difference between them. Um, for Denisova 8 and Denisova 2 uh, over here in uh, the central gallery, central chamber, we know that there's between 20,000 and almost 40,000 year difference and so on and so forth. So using this information, we were able to put it into what we call a Bayesian model, which allows us to incorporate all of this information, the radiocarbon dates, optical ages, the mitochondrial genetic dates, and so on, as well as a uranium series date that we obtained from Denisova 11. And using um, complicated mathematical um, uh, algorithms in OxCal, we were able to calculate the ages of all of these human remains without actually, in, except in one case, directly dating them. This summarizes the results. So you can see that the in red here are the Denisovan ages that we've estimated. This is the age estimated for Denisova 11 and the um, Neanderthal dates here. Um, the age of Denisova 14 is a direct radiocarbon date and the age of Denisova 6, we don't know what kind of human that is because of the lack of DNA. But for the first time, we've been able to date the Denisovans at the type site for Denisovans. What's interesting is that we can also look at these in terms of the climate that was happening at the time. And so you can see that um, at about 120,000 years ago in the Eemian, there's a very large temperature spike um, in stage 5e and uh, we find that over the course of uh, 20,000 years or so, there's um, uh, the temperatures in this part of the world are very um, favorable. And um, although the ages that we have are not very precise, um, they seem to fall in the vicinity of this um, stage 5e peak. We find Denisovans, uh, we find Neanderthals and Denisovans overlapping in periods, of course, based on the, um, uh, the, the genetics of Denny. And later, Neanderthals seem to disappear from the Altai. And we only see Denisovan remains. And the estimates for the age of the latest Denisovans touches about 50,000 years ago. So what about modern humans in this part of the world? Where are they? If we have no um, evidence for modern humans at Denisova cave yet, we have modern humans in the Altai, but at a much later date. And so, this is important because one of the big questions about the um, site of Denisova Cave and indeed other sites in the Altai and the Baikal areas is who might have made those ornaments, those um, pendants made of reindeer and other animal teeth. This is obviously important because um, humans making symbolic objects can be inferred to have a certain degree of cognitive ability the ability to understand meaning and uh, shared symbols, um, membership perhaps of groups, networks, and so on. So the question of um, when um, early Homo sapiens arrived into this area is a very important one. At the moment, um, as I say, the evidence is um, fragmentary, but we do have, um, not at Denisova, but at a site to the northwest, we have a site called Ust Ishim, which is a um, a very important uh, human bone. It was sent to our lab in 2011 and we radiocarbon dated it at more than 40,000 years uh, old. We've su subsequently dated it again 
and the calibrated age for this using the new calibration curve comes out at around 46 to 47,000 years ago. So it's the oldest directly dated anatomically modern human specimen in Eurasia. And what's important about it is that it was um, genetically sequenced in this 2014 paper. And what was discovered was that it had quite a bit of Neanderthal DNA in it. So this is um, an, um, a section from this, the paper by Xiaomei Fu et al. And what it shows is a um, schematic of the chromosome 12 from different humans, from French person, someone from some people from Sardinia, Han Chinese, some people from South America, Papua New Guineans, Australians, and so on. And these are the spots where um, alleles that derive from Neanderthals that are integrated into um, modern human genomes are located. And when the Ustashim uh, genome was sequenced, you can see that there were quite big sections of Neanderthal DNA um, shown here in these yellow blocks, such that it was possible to calculate when the um, integration of this DNA uh, occurred. And it was worked out that it was around 300 generations prior to the life of the Ustashim man, which is about 55,000 years ago. So we know that based on the genome from Ustashim, that uh, the, his ancestors interbred with modern humans somewhere in Eurasia. We don't know where. We also know that this person, this modern human, was living near to the Altai region in Western Siberia at around 47,000 years ago. And when we compare the um, radiocarbon dates from Ustashim with some of the tooth beads and the bone points and um, a some other um, um, direct dates of um, ornaments from Denisova cave, we find that they fall into the same uh, approximate period between around 44,000 to 48,000 years ago. Um, and these bone, uh, these um, directly dated specimens are the oldest that we have in Eurasia. And it's tempting to think that this suggests that there's more of a likelihood that modern humans are making these um, implements and these beads um, and these ornament, or ornamental decorations in this part of the world uh, than it is that Denisovans do it. But we cannot be sure at the moment. And it's equally possible because at um, Denisova cave, we don't have any evidence for um, the presence of modern humans that Denisovans are doing it. And I don't see any reason why that cannot be because in um, the west of Eurasia, we have the Chattelpronian industry, which has been very bitterly debated. Um, is it Neanderthal? Um, is it a Neanderthal stone tool industry or is it a modern human stone tool industry? If it's taken as Neanderthal, then we find the presence of um, similar ornament, ornaments and objects in uh, two sites in France, um, which then suggests that Neanderthals uh, are making them. So it's not inconceivable that Denisovans couldn't be making, I think, similar uh, ornaments in the far east of um, uh, Eurasia and in, uh, in, in Siberia. So in summary, then, what we have with respect to modern humans, Denisovans and Neanderthals is an emerging and complex picture. We know that at some point Denisovans and Neanderthals disappear. We know a fair amount now about when Neanderthals uh, become extinct. Denisovans were not quite so clear because we only have one site at the moment where we have Denisovan um, material, a uh, human material. And although we have um, uh, an unparalleled emerging record of uh, modern human DNA, so we can look at the distribution of that DNA and um, suggest perhaps the um, presence of ancient archaic peoples um, in different parts of East, Eastern Eurasia. Uh, we're, not, we're not certain yet of their distribution at all. And this um, image comes from the work of Kai Prufer et al. in 2014. And what it shows is that um, the um, replacement model has now become a leaky replacement model with integrated DNA coming from Denisovans into modern humans in Oceania, from um, Denisovans into, um, into East Asians in, um, in places like China and Japan, and also from Neanderthals into Denisovans, from the Neanderthals into modern humans, and also from a potentially unknown um, hominin, a ghost population that also integrates into Denisovans. 
a recent paper by Ben Peter and colleagues, uh, sorry, no, by Ben Peter on his own um, from the Max Planck shows that using new statistical methods, every single human bone um, or tooth from Denise of the Cave shows evidence for genetic admixture. Um, it's becoming clear that um, all of these groups interbred with one another on occasion when they met. And so it's becoming very difficult to think um, of single biological species. And it's quite possible that we could even have hybrid populations um, that are living in some of these sites. Um, and rather excitingly, um, some of you may have seen um, that um, a few months ago, uh, a paper was published um, with new discoveries in uh, China in the, on the Tibetan plateau at a site called Baishia Cast Cave, which um, resulted in some very interesting um, an exciting discovery of some human of a human remain. Uh, the, the, the cave itself is a holy cave. Um, it's worshipped by Buddhists. And when Buddhist monks enter the cave um, to pray, they take out a handful of dirt. And in 1980, a Buddhist monk was praying in the cave and he is, uh, it has been suggested that he picked up some dirt and uh, he noticed something lying nearby, which was this um, partial jawbone um, of, a, of a mandible. Um, noticed that it doesn't have a chin. And um, it was uh, attempted to be DNA sequenced, but um, unfortunately had no DNA in it. Um, proteomics was then applied and on the basis of um, a, quite a limited amount of evidence, it was argued that it was a Denisovan and um, dates to around more than 160,000 years ago. And so far it's the only Denisovan remain we have outside Denisova cave yet. So obviously more work needs to be done. It's very exciting. Um, gradually we're building up a picture of who these people were and what their archeology span was, but it's only 10 years since they've been discovered. So um, a lot of work um, still needs to be done in its early days yet. So in conclusion, um, Denise of a cave is really important because it's the only archeological site in the world which has evidence for these three different types of Paleolithic humans. Um, by applying new AMS dating, Bayesian modeling, and bioarchaeological methods, we've managed to build a chronology for the site. And we've also used novel methods to identify new human remains from the site using uh, zooms. And um, this is rather exciting because it opens up a new opportunity for um, finding um, small pieces of bone uh, that couldn't previously be identified. And these results and the work uh, that's been undertaken by um, geneticists shows that there's been a great deal of interbreeding between these various groups. And this, I think, happened when they met um, rather than being um, ongoing and continuous. And as I said at the end, rather excitingly, new remains of Denisovans are now being found in other parts of Eastern Asia. There are other human bones and pieces of crania that have been found prior to this which are now being looked at by physical anthropologists. And one can only hope that we find more and more bones from Denisovans in the next few uh, years. I'd like to acknowledge uh, finally um, all of the people that I've worked with over the last uh, few decades. Um, the Paleocron team, which um, was this project that I ran over the last uh, six or seven years based in Oxford as well as the, our colleagues in um, the Max Planck in Leipzig, who we work with quite closely, everybody at the Denisova Cave um, archeological team, um, the OSL team that we worked with um, based in the University of Wollongong and everybody uh, in Oxford, and of course, uh, the people that fund our work. And finally, I'd just like to say that um, in uh, March, 2021, I have a, a book coming out, which is going to talk about a lot of the stories that I've just been talking about um, and try to um, describe some of the work that's been done, um, tell, tell, telling you uh, more about uh, Denisovans and uh, who they were, and uh, about the complexity of humanity uh, in this very interesting um, period. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much, Tom. That was an amazing talk. Um, okay, so. Ahora vamos a pasar a las preguntas. Eh, por favor, que las escriban por el chat. Eh, 
Por lo tanto, si, bueno, sorry. If you have any questions, please write them in the chat so I can read them to Tom. So, aquí hay una pregunta de Nora Franca, Nora Franco. Dice, thank you very much for your interesting talk. Do you believe that there are chances that the Nisabans are some variety of Homo erectus? Um, yes, that, that's, that's been suggested um, by, by, um, by some people, well, privately more than, more than publicly. But yes, um, we have um, Homo erectus is out there in, in the background, of course. Um, and this, for those that don't know, this is a tremendously successful hominin that we see radiating out from Africa um, around 1.5 million years ago and perhaps um, surviving until quite late. Um, recent dates from Indonesia, uh, from the site of Nandong, suggest Homo erectus could have um, been present in island Southeast Asia um, 100,000 years ago, perhaps even less, others have suggested. So yes, it's possible. And I think this is um, one of the interesting reasons why the Denisovans have never been um, given um, a Linnaean ta uh, taxon taxonomic name because of the fact that if they did turn out to be Homo erectus, then we'd be in a, a bit of a pickle in terms of, um, uh, of, of giving them perhaps a new, a new name like Homo altiensis, then we'd, we'd have to go back and revisit that. But it's possible. Um, I think what we really need is, um, is, is a lot more biological evidence. And what I'm hearing is that the, uh, the, the data from the uh, Baishia cave um, uh, mandible and other um, physical evidence from other sites isn't completely indicative of Homo erectus. It's more what we would define in the old days as um, archaic Homo, perhaps, um, with indications of quite mixed um, physical appearance. Um, uh, teeth that don't appear immediately to be Homo erectus. So I think it may be more complicated um, than simply thinking that it's Homo erectus. I think that it, it may be that the ancient DNA that's coming into Denisovans, um, the archaic DNA that I mentioned in the slide previously, maybe that's integrated from Homo erectus and perhaps Denisovans or something else completely. I mean, we, we know that um, the DNA um, from, um, that has been obtained suggests that Neanderthals and Homo erectus split from one another um, around 530,000 years ago. And this is later than, um, than the presence of Homo erectus. So on that basis alone, it seems less likely um, that, uh, that, that Denisovans are Homo erectus. I think um, they're more, um, as I say, based on the DNA, they're more akin to um, Neanderthal cousins rather than deriving from a much earlier hominin group in, in Eastern Asia. Okay. Thank you. Here we have another question from Tere Plaza. She asks, when you find pieces of, of human bone, is it possible to know is, if they are part of the same individual? Um, yeah, we can, uh, we can test that. Uh, of course, there are several methods um, from very basic, looking at seeing if they're the same date, um, from looking at they're seeing this, if they have the same stable isotope values. But the best method would be looking at ancient DNA. And all of the remains so far from Denisova um, all suggest that they're, that they're, that they're not from, one, uh, from more than one individual. So they're all separate people. Um, initially, the large tooth and the Denisova three, so Denisova four and Denisova three, they were suggested as possibly being from the same uh, individual, just in different parts of the cave. But the uh, mitochondrial DNA showed that they were actually separate, uh, two different people. They differed by two mutations uh, in the mitochondrial DNA, which is enough to say that they're not from the same person. Thank you. Um, there is another question from Ayushi. She asks, why do you think there is such a strong pushback against expanding our ideas of cognition, behavioral, modernity, culture? Um, that's a that's a difficult question. Um, could you repeat it? I didn't get you. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Out, yes, sorry. Could you repeat? Um, do you want to ask Ayushi directly? Yeah, I oh, have hi, always... hi, Tom. How you doing? <laughs> I'm good, thank you. Um, so I have always wondered why, um, whether it be with Denisovans, whether it be with Neanderthals, or you know, anything apart from us or how we think of 
of who we think of as us. There's yeah. the, like, at the slightest um, suggestion, whether it's chronologically, whether it's to do with lithics, whether it's to do with other kinds of archeological material, yeah. um, at the slightest suggestion that it might be associated with someone other than our species, yeah. um, for the most part, there seems to be quite a strong pushback. I feel like the vast majority of Paleolithic archaeologists or yeah. um, you know yeah. anthropologists have a very um, strong view that uh, yeah. these ideas of uh, higher cognition or of mm -hmm. behavioral modernity or of these mm -hmm. different cultural objects is specific just to us. And yeah. I wonder what your thoughts were on why yeah. you think there's such a strong view about that. Yeah, I think it. I mean, it, I think it. Ultimately, it's historical. Um, if you're looking at it from a basic standpoint of, you know, um, Herbert Spencer and the survival of the fittest, I think in 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 no small part it's due to the fact that we've looked back at us surviving and being the only humans now on the planet, and we've looked at others that uh, failed, and we've thought that well, they're less successful than us, and therefore we must be cognitively better and more successful than them. And um, they failed because they weren't so clever and weren't so advanced cognitively as us. Um, but as you know, and I think many people know now, now this is, um, has been um, a, a theory that has been under um, some modification. And as we, as, we, as, we, as we focus on, in my case, the work that we do on the chronological aspects of it, we find that the European Paleolithic record, which um, was, you know, I think for, for many um, decades, one in which we saw modern humans um, coming in seemingly uh, at the drop of a hat and um, with, armed with this um, symbolic uh, behavior and this um, uh, improved technology, um, we're now seeing a, a, a somewhat different story. As I said at the, towards the beginning of my talk, we, we now see that it's not a sudden replacement at all we find that it's um, a process that took place over thousands of years. I think it's likely that it's up to 10,000 years in which we see modern humans and Neanderthals um, living not side by side, but definitely in the same general region. And this would have facilitated you know, contact. We know that there's interbreeding. It's not simply a, a case of one superior group coming in and rubbing the other one out. And more and more now we're finding in archeological sites um, that are associated with Neanderthals, um, a, a great deal more um, complexity than we hitherto thought. We find that they are making um, uh, ornaments on occasion. They seem to be interested in feathers. Um, they seem to be interested in de self-decoration. We find um, evidence for colorants, um, red ochre, um, natural jarosite, uh, yellow um, uh, ochres that are found in some sites in Spain. Um, controversially, perhaps, we also find evidence um, in some Spanish sites that they may have been producing rock art, although this is being debated and it rests a lot on the reliability of uranium series dates that um, are dating material that covers the surface of the paintings of, of, the, of the rock art uh, itself. Personally, I think that those dates are reliable and that we are in a, um, a period of really revisiting and relooking at the ability of some of these so-called archaic groups as being um, cognitively uh, at, at the same level that, as we are. I don't think there is the same gulf or gap. And that's why I'm much more open to considering the possibility that uh, groups of Denisovans could have been um, undertaking and involved in similar types of uh, display and symbolic um, um, artifactual production uh, that we um, hitherto associated almost exclusively with um, modern humans. Okay. Thank you very much. I don't know if we have any other questions. Alguna otra pregunta para Tom? Um, okay, Felipe Martinez, he's asking, you mentioned the evidence may imply a model of leaky replacement, or is the evidence closer to an, an assimilation model? Yes, no, why? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Um, I I don't think we can exclude the uh, assim an assimilation model either, and it kind of depends on. Um, well, I, I think that there's a lot of evidence now that um, Neanderthal populations and perhaps um, Denisovans as well, although not quite so much, that Neanderthal populations weren't very large. Um, some of the genetic estimates um, 
don't um, allow us to think of more than about 5,000 Neanderthals uh, across this space. In the Altai, the high coverage genomes um, show that there's a lot of homozygosity, which means that the parents of that particular individual whose DNA we're analyzing, we're quite closely related. In fact, very closely related, suggesting that those groups were very small. So this raises the possibilities that those groups were assimilated rather than disappeared or went extinct. So at the moment, I don't think we can entirely exclude the possibility of assimilation of populations. Um, I think we need uh, to have more um, evidence in, the, in terms of um, uh, uh, well um, uh, identified bones and well excavated archaeological sites and more um, high coverage genomes before we can be completely sure. But um, I think it's, it's, it's very difficult to exclude the possibility at the moment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, any other questions? Or preguntas? Well, seems like we don't have more questions, but thank you very much, Tom, again. Um, that was very, very, very nice and interesting. <laughs> thank, you. thank you very much for inviting me, Fran, and uh, thanks for everyone for um, tuning in and, and, uh, and, and listening. It's been really a great experience, and um, I um, hope that uh, if anyone has any questions or any more comments, then just drop me an email and drop me a line. I'd be really happy to discuss anything offline. Okay, <laughs> that's great. Thank you, and gracias. Eh, espero nos volvamos a ver en alguna próxima instancia de seminarios y muchas gracias por su participación durante todo este semestre pandémico en el seminario de Bioarqueología y Cronología. Que estén muy bien y nos vemos pronto. Y thank you very much everyone for coming online and hope to see you soon in our next seminar series. So, bye bye, take care. Cuídense. Buenas noches. Buenas noches.